All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good day, everybody. This is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal, welcoming you to our latest edition in the Geographical Digest webinar series, our educational series. Uh, we're thrilled this week to present to you Pure Expression, Finding Balance Between Vineyard and Winery. Uh, this has been uh, obviously put together by the Psalm Journal, our friends at SomCon. This uh, recording will be available as part of SomGo. And it will also be a editorial recap, a feature in the February, March issue of the Psalm Journal. So please tune into that. Quick shout out to our editor in chief, Meredith May. Thank you for brainchilding this, of course. And uh, in our partnership with National Geographic Magazine. And key is the new Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia that they're publishing. So this is um, a, a series of great resources that you have here. Our um, uh, theme today basically looks at, you know, the, the famous statement, wine is made in the vineyard. Uh, true. And if that, but if that's the point, and I'm being a little facetious, you know that, but if that's the wine is made in the vineyard, then why do we bother with all that expensive, fancy equipment in the winery? Um, we're going we're gonna to delve into that a little bit with the people that have their hands on that, uh, on that topic and that discussion um, uh, and talk a little bit about the, the how to bring out terroir with some technique. Now, our I'm sorry, I said um, February, March issue. It's actually going to be in the January, February issue of Psalm Journal, the recap. So be on the lookout for that. You get it a little bit sooner. Uh, and it'll also be available, uh, a recording of this on our the Psalm Journal website, psalmjournal.com, as well as our YouTube site. So I'd like to open it up by actually welcoming um, Orsi uh, Sen Senkiri, who is the editor of the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. Uh, Orthi Orsi is a very interesting uh, person. She's got a background uh, in law. Uh, she's a doctor of law specializing in uh, the protected origins of wine, which obviously is key to this discussion, as it is many others. She's worked as a sommelier. Uh, she is a fantastic consultant with her own company called Liquid Talent and a judge at the International Wine Challenge. And she also um, does tasting at the wine app What Wine. But uh, she's here today to talk to us, and we thought it would be interesting uh, for Orsi to address a little bit about the OIV's view of how wine is defined in terms of its terroir. So welcome, Orsi. Thank you, Lars, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, let me please start with uh, just thanking all of you to, uh, to be able to be part of this conversation today. Um, there's been some absolute industry legends that I'm sharing a screen with, so um, I'm a little bit start stuck. But um, just to start off, uh, is wine made in the vineyard? According to the OIV, yes and no. Um, they, apart from terroir, uh, in, in their terroir um, uh, definition, they obviously list the geographical conditions or the um, climatic conditions, but they put a huge emphasis on the human contribution. And I think this is um, what is really interesting and, and just to um, uh, put the question up, uh, whether, whether there, would there be wine without um, you know, human interaction? And um, there probably wouldn't, so. Um, There'd be vinegar, <laughs> but not wine. <laughs> exactly, I heard um, a, a very interesting speech uh, from Michel Chapoutier, who we know is aiming to, um, um, you know, mess, mess with his wines as little as possible. But he said that um, wine is practically grape juice on its way to become vinegar. And the, uh, and the winemaker's only job is to, uh, is to stop it while it's still wine. And I, I find it an incredibly interesting uh, definition of a winemaker's role. But also, um, just as um, we might hear from Xavier um, in the champagne industry, champagne is an extremely technical thing. Uh, so um, there's definitely no champagne without, uh, without um, human um, contribution. So um, the, uh, the best uh, wines are celebrated partly because of where they are grown, but also um, 
by because it's they are grown by great people and um, so i'm really really looking forward to um hearing uh everybody's views on the subject and i'm sure that i will learn a lot from all of you absolutely I think we've all got a lot to learn and it's exciting that we're looking at so many different uh terroirs and places around the globe so thank you orsi and thank you again for that wonderful resource with the new sotheby's uh, so first up, as uh, Orsi alluded to, is uh, Xavier Barlier, who is the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communication for Misson Mark and Domain. He is presenting Louis Roder's Champagne and quite appropriate. Uh, not only, as you can see, he's well prepared because he is a Chevalier of the Ordre de Coteau de Champagne. And I apologize for my French uh, on that, Xavier. Please feel free to correct me, but uh, you look like you're... Uh, ready to do business in the fields of Champagne and the vineyards of Champagne. So please. I was Welcome. born ready. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Lars, uh, shall I uh, share my screen? Please. And um, can I do it as we speak? Absolutely. Uh, this is right here, full screen. I had a full training with Lars yesterday, so. Uh, Good morning, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, and uh, I'm delighted to be here this, this morning uh, and to have the opportunity to share with you a little bit of the magic of Louis Rodrea. I've been with the company for 10, 20 years now, and before joining the company, I was a fan in my uh, previous uh, lives as a corporate executive, and um, I was so much in love with the house that um, I sent a, an application to Monsieur Jean-Claude Rousseau at the time, who was the president of Louis Rodrea. And um, he was very kind to offer me a job and I've never looked back. And um, I absolutely love what I do. And um, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, the Champagne region. Um, Champagne only comes from the Champagne region, as you know, because it's a unique terroir and uh, a savoir-faire like no other. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of the family, the Louis Rodrea family, the seven successive generation, uh, with the same relentless purpose of the pursuit of taste. And then finally, I'm going to present the wine to you, the Brut Premier, which we consider being the timeless expression of the house style of Louis Rodrea. So first and foremost, the Champagne region, uh, which is uh, in France, uh, about um, 47 minutes from Paris, if you take the high-speed train. Um, if you drive with me, that's gonna be about the same time. And if this is last, that might be an hour and a half, more leisurely uh, driving. Um, I'm gonna talk about the three main regions because we have other regions like the Aube region, which is south of, of Champagne. So Champagne is on the east, northeastern side of, of Paris. And the three regions are the Montagne de Reims, it's not a mountain, really. We call it a mountain. It's a 1,000 feet elevation. Uh, the soil is essentially clay, the rich clay. And the orientation is about north, northeast. This is the kingdom, the kingdom of the rich Pinot Noir. And uh, historically, the first acquisition of Rue was there in 1841. And this is still the vineyards we own in Verzi and Verzonnet, the Grand Cru vineyards. Then we have the Valley de la Marne, which is the valley along the Marne River. This is uh, the kingdom of the elegant Pinot Noir and the Pinot Meunier, a little bit of Chardonnay, uh, with a very famous village, Aïe, among others, uh, where we own the vineyards, uh, where we uh, make the Cristal Champagne. And then we have in the southern part of the region, Côte des Blancs. Uh, the soil is chalk, which is uh, a form of limestone, very powdery, very poor. And this is where Chardonnay grows in Champagne. The Champagne region is an historical terroir. Uh, it's calcareous, originally planted by the Romans 2,000 years ago to make wines for the army. Station is what is today Germany. Uh, this is the most northern uh, vineyard in France with a cool climate um, between oceanic and continental and a production process con constantly perfected since the 18th century, the method champenoise, the two-step process that we're gonna talk a little about uh, a little later. We have beautiful summers in Champagne and we need them for the photosynthesis, for the maturity of the grapes. 
and we have very cold winters. But we love the cold winters because it cleans the soil, it kills all the viruses. And the colder the winters, of course, the healthier um, the growing season. In 1776, two major events occurred and would change the world forever. And the first is the founding of the House of Louis Rodrea. The second, I don't quite remember, um, but it was in 1776. Uh, but it is not until 1833 that the House of Louis Rodrea, as we know it today, uh, was uh, named. Uh, Louis Rodrea in 1833 inherited the house from his uncle, Monsieur Schreder, who was the owner at the, the late 18th century. Monsieur Schreder was from Alsace, East of France, and Monsieur Rodrea, the same. Uh, Louis Rodrea started to acquire vineyards in 1841 with the vision that the great champagne, a grand champagne, must be, uh, you must control your vineyards. And uh, to last point about, and um, earlier said, wines are made in the vineyards, and it is true for champagne. Louis Rodrea I uh, passed away in 1870. It was succeeded by his son, Louis Rodrea II, who was at the helm of the house for only 10 years passed away young, but he is credited to create, in 1876, crystal champagne for the Tsar of Russia, Alexander II. His sister, Leonie, uh, who had married Monsieur Ollery, succeeded the brother, and then her two sons, Le Louis I at the end of the 19th century, and Leon at the beginning of the 20th century, Leon Ollery Ollerer, uh, managed the house until 1933. In 1933, Léon passes away and his young wife, Camille, a beautiful, smart woman, inherits the house and is gonna lead the house of Louis Rodrea through very, very, uh, very tough times, um, obviously, uh, essentially World War II. And she put the house back on its feet and uh, restored Louis Rodrea to its original glory uh, in starting 1950s. Jean-Claude Rousseau joined the company in 1967. He was an engineer in viticulture. He became the CEO and the president in 1979 and retired in 2006. And Frédéric Rousseau, the seventh generation in the family, uh, joined the company in 1996, become the president CEO. And Frédéric, a charming, very smart man, only 53 years old, uh, leads the, the company and all the all the other properties of the family. What is very particular about Louis Rodrer, among many other things, is that we own 600 acres of vineyards, which is one of the very largest uh, vineyards in Champagne, essentially, and also uh, owned by a family. And these 600 acres of uh, vineyards are Grand Cru and Premier Cru only in the three main regions. Viticulture is very important to us because we cultivate our own vineyards. Uh, the vineyards are organically certified, and one, one third of them are even in biodynamic viticulture. Uh, we use horses whenever it makes sense to, evoke, to avoid too much compaction in the soil. It's very poetic. This is my, uh, one of my favorite photos. Um, that's my home screen, actually. Uh, we use only, only the first pressing of the grapes, what we call the vin de cuvée, and we sell uh, the, the rest of the juice um, to other negotiants. Winemaking in the Louis Rodrea philosophy is nothing but the continuation of viticulture. So if we do a very sophisticated viticulture, we, we need to do very precise winemaking. So we own 600 acres of vineyards in 410 plots. So we have 450 tanks in order for us to do parcel vinification. With all the care in the vineyards, we want the wines to reflect the quality of, of the various terroirs of Louis Rodrea. We also have these 165 oak vats of 1,500 gallons where we store the vin de réserve, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And this Pinot Noir and Chardonnay enter the blend of the Brut Premier, which is a small bottle I have here to present to you, which is really our opinion about the terroir of Champagne. These are the flavor and aromas of our 
multi-vintage champagne. Uh, we use up to 10 to 30% of these reserve wines, and we include up to seven different vintages in this Brut Premier. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And if you want to know more about Cuy Rare, please log on to their wonderful website where you will find videos and a lot more information. And um, thank you all for attending this seminar this morning and cheers to you. Thank you, Xavier. Fantastic. I'm gonna ask you to take your uh, screen share down. Very well done. Uh, it was fascinating to, uh, I think a lot of times we tend not to always automatically consider the terroir of Champagne because it seems to be so technique driven, but that was a great look into the true terroir. Um, and uh, I want to ask a very personal question, Xavier, what is your opinion as a Chevalier on the idea of sabering a bottle of Champagne? Should it be done or not? I have mixed feelings about it. I uh, almost uh, killed a very famous uh, actor uh, in Hollywood during an event like this because the, the neck of the bottle um, exploded and he got um, part of uh, the neck of the bottle uh, just, you know, above his, above his head. So um, I was a very fan of doing that when I was younger and I've nev never done, done it um, ever since. I recognize that this is a tradition that it's back to the Napoleonic times when the Napoleonic uh, army was uh, stationed in Champagne. Um, it's very festive. Uh, if you do it, um, be very, very careful. And remember that the pressure in a bottle of Champagne is equal to two and a half uh, times the pressure in the tires of your car. So there is a lot of pressure on these bottles. Yep. Make it very cold and be very careful. So thank you. Thank you, Xavier. So next up, uh, we're going to take a trip to Virginia, to Barbersville Vineyards, and Luca Paschini, who is the executive director. Uh, Luca was born in Torino, educated in Alba, Piedmont, worked in, in Europe, of course, and came to Barbersville, Virginia in 1990 and helped develop what is a wildly interesting property there. He's been very active with the Virginia Wine Board and the Virginia Wineries Association. Uh, and I know he's uh, looking forward to getting a visit back to, uh, to Piedmont to get recharged. He hasn't been able to do that for a while. But in the meantime, tell us what's going on in Virginia, please, Luca. Well, Merol, thank you for uh, having me here today with this beautiful group of uh, growers. And uh, briefly, I want to tell you one main thing that Virginia is very, very young wine region. It barely started establishing in the late 70s. And one of the key uh, elements of this start was the, the Zoning family. They are a large uh, family of vintners in Italy. They have nine wine estates from Sicily to Puglia, three estates in Tuscany, Piemonte, Lombardy, and Friuli. And the founder of the state, Johnny Zoning, in the 1970, wanted to start a winery in the United States. He traveled to Napa Valley, to Central Valley, to Finger Lakes, and then came to Virginia uh, under a suggestion from a friend that lived here in the area. And that's how he started. So uh, basically, with this little time I have to uh, explain uh, about this emerging uh, wine region, I want to start by saying that uh, we have a multitude of soils in Virginia. We have vineyard uh, planted from very few feet above sea level on the coast, uh, on the Chesapeake Bay, all the way up to the British Mountain. Now we have growers going to 2,000 feet with Pinot Noir. We're in an area that is facing west or the British Mountain. We are the foothills of the Southwest Mountain. And we have a lot of red clay here. Uh, clay that originates from uh, a type of rock, which is right here, a serpentine uh, family of rock, basically through slow uh, oxidation uh, and ferrolysis process, basically this rock transforms into clay. And during this process, what is cool, I learned a few years ago, it, it expands 1.8 times. So uh, it's very slow, the process. So when I came here 32 vintages ago, I basically was a, still a work of exploration and, and testing varietals, testing different uh, sites within 900 acre farm we have. 
And uh, as you know, you know, we're in a business where you have one shot per year. We're not in the brewing where you just, you know, start another one and turn the water on. I, I'm not uh, disparaging uh, uh, microbreweries. I love great beers, but I'm just uh, saying uh, uh, that after 32 years being here, uh, I'm basically starting to set uh, the ground for the next generation of winemakers. So in this 32 years, uh, what I had uh, the opportunity to do was, as I say, to explore, to observe uh, different varieties and also learning how to adapt to the weather, which in Virginia here is very variable. We can go from a very dry season to a wet one. That's due to the jet stream that is shifting. Uh, in Italy, actually, where I grew up, it's not that different. We can go, uh, I grew up in Piemonte, you can go from a very dry, hot season to a wet one. And then you have to learn in those conditions how you can best adapt. And that is the skill of, uh, the, and the influence of, of man. It's how to first educate the vines. You know, vines are, uh, it's a vine. They, they're, they're designed to climb, to go on their own. And then as those vintners, we're forcing them in a way, educating them to grow within a space, underground and above ground. And then in the cellar, again, I, I agree with the expression that you don't want to uh, uh, force uh, the expression of the wine in one direction or the other. You have to kind of nurture it naturally. Although I'm very much against uh, some uh, slang that some people used few years ago, I visited a winery and I asked, uh, so who is the winemaker? And, and I was told, oh, we don't have a winemaker. Uh, the wine makes itself. I say, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, going back to, again, this, this understanding of terroir, it really is man that is uh, given this beautiful gift of, of the land and, uh, and the vine, we train it. Then when we come in the cellar, again, uh, through time uh, of observation, you have to define a style that fits best uh, your place uh, you are at. And, uh, and so the major things we have done really uh, are, again, are mainly in the vineyard. We have done a lot of uh, changes in, especially in the pruning techniques we use. As of 10 years ago, we were really uh, resetting the pruning, uh, maintaining a good continuity on the sap flow uh, on, on the vine, avoiding any large cuts, uh, that, like the Simonit and Search uh, uh, company, we work with them with great results. In the cellar instead, uh, I, I consider myself very much a traditionalist. Uh, um, I, yes, I like to use technology if it aids to uh, get things done uh, more efficiently uh, and help uh, our own work physically, makes it simple. But I shy away from any fashion, basically. Uh, I have seen that, and I believe that get fashions in many different fields, they start at one point, they take a whole spin and they end up being at the, at the beginning. And so uh, I'm very cautious about implemented big changes just to say, oh, I want to make something new. I want to now have uh, an egg in my cellar so I can talk about something different. And, uh, and, and again, there I'm not against it, but I'm just saying when you go to a cellar and you're giving a tour and then you have like maybe a thousand barrel and then a conversation shift to two eggs that are in the middle of the cellar. My question is, why don't you have a thousand eggs and two barrels if it's that good? So anyway, this is a little bit of who I am, what I do. Uh, one of the things I've done here that was very unique uh, was uh, at the very beginning to understand uh, uh, which varieties would produce uh, uh, consistency. And at the beginning, I discovered here that on clay, uh, Merlot and Cabernet Franc are incredibly re reliable as instead the Cabernet Sauvignon is not, therefore, we can produce, uh, let's say, uh, a, a very good Cabernet Sauvignon two years every 10 with a very, very dry condition. 
but Merlot and Cabernet Franc, they, they thrive on clay. They need a bit more uh, uh, water. And actually we do have occasionally to irrigate uh, manually. We don't have uh, in place uh, an irrigation system. So in a, in a way we are dry farming. Uh, the other thing that I really uh, like to bring to attention is uh, that uh, for us as a wine region, I had to really uh, set aside thousands of bottles in aging and we're still at, at the moment we, we have thousands of cases. Uh, one great example is Octagon or Bordeaux blend which we uh, start producing in the late uh, 90s, 97, 98 vintage and that really was the wine that put Virginia on the map for sure. That came from newly planted vineyard in the early 90s sell, uh, planting new clones that before were never been planted in Virginia, like Clone 181. Most of us know what, what it is, where it comes from. And the task uh, then was, will this wine age? And I have to say today, we're drinking wines from the late 90s and they're in perfect condition. Another ex great example of uh, a discovery of the terroir was Nebbiolo. I have a bottle here from 98, the first vintage we produced. And the wine uh, at the moment is in perfect shape. Uh, some of the decision we took were more uh, coming from uh, logic, like Merlot and Franc on clay. Nebbiolo, of course, is unheard of. I get a lot of slack for planting Nebbiolo on clay. I worked in Piemonte and, uh, you know, when you're there, you're told, oh, it doesn't grow anywhere. It only grows well in, in, uh, in, in, in our area. I decided to do it anyway. I planted half acre. Today we're still drinking uh, the Nebbiolo 98 and from that half acre we now have to a 20 acre uh, uh, planting. I have to say that was not as very well received uh, uh, at the beginning because it's an obscure wine, Nebbiolo. The Barolo and Barbaresco are more known. Uh, although when I, uh, uh, through the years, we really have seen a, a, a great increase in, in, in appreciation for a wine that yet doesn't have a deep color, a wine that actually, yes, does have some uh, uh, intense astringency, uh, but uh, I persisted. You have to believe in what you do uh, uh, as a winemaker, as a grape grower, and I'm glad I stick to it and when and push forward and so um, uh, one of the things I really think is that we have to again uh, explore, observe, adapt and believe uh, to establish a, a great brand and a great vineyard. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Luca. Well stated. Very interesting uh, from one area, you know, um, our last webinar was on uh, Domestic bliss, and of course, we uh, did a little tribute to to Thomas Jefferson's dream of mm -hmm. America as a wine uh, nation, and that's Virginia's where it all started. So it's fun to hear a little bit about the Virginia terroir, the techniques, and blows my mind that there's Nebbiolo uh, thriving in Virginia. Uh, I know en Enrico can join me in that uh, sentiment that usually, even in Italy, in Nebbiolo doesn't like to leave certain hillsides in Piedmont. So uh, that's very neat, and I look forward to trying that. So now uh, we're going to hear from David Coventry of Talbot Vineyards. Uh, Dave is the winemaker. Uh, Talbot is in uh, the Santa Lu Lucia Highlands, Monterey. Uh, as an Italian, I want to say Santa Lucia. I don't know what is the more appropriate, but I'm going to go with that. Uh, Dave is a native of Monterey. And uh, interestingly enough, Dave um, got his degree in biology and joined a rock band before seeing the light and going toward wine. Um, <laughs> But he's going to speak to us now about the uh, SLH AVA and his Sleepy Hollow Vineyard and how he finds expression, pure pure expression with that. All right. Welcome, Dave. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, my name is David Coventry. I'm the winemaker at Talbot Vineyards in the Santa Lucia Highlands. That's how, that's how we pronounce it here. Um, <laughs> I'm a Monterey County native. Um, I was born and raised here. Um, this is my uh, 23rd vintage in the area. Um, that is significant because I think to really express terroir, um, it is a partnership between the winemaker and the vineyard, and it takes some time to establish that relationship and that partnership and that 
depth of understanding where you can learn and you can tell what it needs from you so that you can get the best out of it. Um, I think of a vine as a lens. Oh, thank you very okay. much. Um, I've, um, could I have the next Absolutely. slide, please? Thank you, Lars. I had that ready to go, but you are too fast. Thank you for helping a winemaker out. Oh, we pleasure. need it. Um, <laughs> um, I think about vines as a lens that focuses the flavor, uh, the power, the energy, and the integrity of the vineyard. Uh, what you're looking at right here is the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard, our north um, part of the vineyard. So you're at the very northern um, vines looking south down the Salinas Valley across the San Lucia Highlands. You can see some Chardonnay vines in front of you. And for those of you who have the 2017 Talbot Sleepy Hollow Chardonnay uh, to sip, I see Lars does, um, the very wine you are drinking comes from exactly what I am showing you now. So I just want you to feel that, that sense of this wine, that place. And I think that's the basis of any really good conversation on terroir. Uh, you can see on the upper right-hand side of this, beautiful, um, of this beautiful picture, those are the San Lucia Highlands rising up uh, above the vineyard. And um, that acts as a, as, as a rain shadow for um, storms coming in off of the off of the Pacific Ocean, so those those mountains, if you went oh another twelve miles west, we are looking south. The mountains are on your west. If you went another twelve miles west, you would be in the in the Pacific Ocean. So, how does this affect the wine? Um, it gives an incredibly steady state to uh, the weather around the vineyard. Um, we like to say that vines like to grow where people like to live, um, just because they're very smart. They're very smart plants. They, they, they get us to put them and caretake them in some of the most beautiful places in the world. People so like the to where vines like to grow too. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and the colliery to that statement is, um, this was thought up by my enologist, Cassandra. She said, yes, uh, vines like to grow where people like to live, but also the better the view, the better the wine. Oh. So this is truly a, a spectacular view down the Salinas Valley of Monterey County. Um, this is Steinbeck country for sure. Um, the vineyard is planted on a very gentle slope. So this is a, a bench land. And um, if you look at the nature of vineyards uh, almost the world over, uh, the great vineyards are somewhat planted on hillsides. Um, just because of how gravity works and how um, the top of a, of a hillside has very sparse soil. The middle of the hillside has a kind of a moderate depth and vigor of soil and kind of the flatlands are higher vigor because that's where um, soil, dirt and everything else, gravity just pulls it down. So um, on the flatlands of most areas, that's where you want to plant vegetables. It's on the hillsides that, that grapes really find their home. And you would think that that highest part with the most sparse soil might produce the best quality. Not really so. Uh, it's the center section, kind of the heart of a slope that very often, almost always produces the best quality vines. Um, they struggle a little bit, have their crop load sort of concentrated and moderated naturally, but they're not overly stressed. It just so happens that, that the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard has, is made up almost entirely of that beautiful heart of the slope area. Um, before we leave this, uh, the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard is about 550 acres. Uh, that's the Queen's measure. For those of you who use the metric system, God bless you all. It is 200 hectares. So um, it, is, it is a very, uh, a very nicely sized uh, vineyard uh, planted entirely to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. As I said, we are only, please, next slide. Um, we are only 12 miles from uh, the Monterey Bay and the Pacific Ocean, so um, we are truly a cool climate vineyard. Um, for, for those of you who keep track of these things, regions, wine growing regions are basically ranked one, two, three, four, five, one being cold, five being very, very warm. We're sub region one, <laughs> so it is very, very cool area. And um, when you taste this Chardonnay, um, you can taste the detail to the wine, the highly detailed flavors of um, bosque pear, apples, hints of vanilla, hard spice, brioche, some yeastiness, 
vanilla. Um, it's a very complex and, and interesting set of flavors. And of course that begins in the vineyard with that partnership that we have. Um, I think Lars started off by saying something to the effect of if wines are made in the vineyard, why do we have wineries and winemakers? Well, again, it is a partnership. And I think wineries exist uh, to correct for the oddities that vineyards have. There are very few absolutely perfect vineyards. Um, there are spectacular examples of that, but a winery is where the winemaker gets to participate in the creation of this beautiful beverage that we call wine and be part of that process. And um, I think that in the true definition of terroir, if you go back into the French tradition, is it's an interaction of a human being, a winemaker with the vineyard to bring the best out of it. And I truly think that that's what we do at uh, Talbot. Um, the, <laughs> my vineyard manager, his name is Kevin. He is truly a vine whisperer. He knows what I want and he brings me absolutely beautiful, beautiful grapes. And then uh, at that point, that handoff moment of he has spent six, nine months growing them and he gives them to me, that moment of handoff, that's where I become a custodian of all of those flavors and lovely character that uh, he has so well nurtured um, by paying attention to the vines and nurturing that piece of ground. So does he tell you not to mess it up? Is that what oh, he, he does indeed. Okay, this is one year of my life. It's one year of your life. Get it right, Coventry. Um, but you're at two minutes, Dave. Okay. Um, this is a the San Lucia Highlands Appalachian, very small Appalachian. It's only about 15 miles long and about one mile wide. So um, if you look at some of the great uh, vineyard areas around the world, this is an exceptional example of a very small one that is so specific and so perfect for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. As an outgrowth of being so close to the ocean, if you look at the top of this map where Sleepy Hollow North is, um, it can be, for example, uh, 20 degrees Celsius there, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And for every mile you go south um, in the Appalachian, you can gain um, a half a degree Celsius, almost a, a full degree Celsius for every um, every two kilometers you go south. I'm trying to stay metric for all you people out there. So um, if for Chardonnay and Pinot especially, they love that cool climate, long hang time, beautiful bright acidity, for the, for the Pinot Noir, excellent color, great tannic structure. What the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard does so well, and in such a traditionally Grand Cru, I'll borrow that term, a Grand Cru way, is that it is a hybrid of the best of the old world winemaking traditions of uh, silky tannins, bright acidity and structure with obviously new world ripeness, flavors and opulence. We bind those two traditions together as yet another uh, facet of terroir. Um, please do try the Pinot Noir. Again, an excellent example of a highly detailed, truly classic rendering. Um, wine is an acid preserved beverage. Uh, we forget this, it's not alcohol preserved, it's not really sugar preserved with some examples, beautiful examples, but truly for wines like this, they're an acid preserved beverage and um, the Sleepy Hollow Vineyard just has beautiful natural acidity. It helps the freshness of the wine, the longevity of the wine, the integrity, and really um, everything that, that gives it vinous character. And as it says right here, thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it. Well put, thank you, Dave. Uh, I have to say, sipping both of those wines, beautiful round fruit, but at the same time, well sustained by great acidity from that cool climate. It really, uh, it really shows. So you've done a good job of finding balance between the vineyard and the winery. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So now we're going to go to Napa with Molly Hill, who's the winemaker at Sequoia Grove. Uh, Molly's worked at several different wineries in California, as well as Chile. She's been at Sequoia Grove since 2003. And um, even long before we thought about this, uh, this theme for this webinar, Molly's personal mantra, I've been told, is balance in winemaking. So how very appropriate. So Molly, tell us about how you uh, get some beautiful balance between the vineyard and the winery at Sequoia Grove. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm lucky enough to have been the winemaker here for uh, 18 vintages or involved in the winemaking for 18 vintages. 
um, which I think uh, is a very special honor. Like um, getting to know uh, a site, I think takes time. And so I'm very lucky to have gotten to work with these, these vineyards um, for quite a while. So let me just start the presentation here. So I call myself a winemaker, but I also think that I'm chief energy transmitter. So my job is to take what is really beautiful in the Napa Valley with the focus on Rutherford and coax out those flavors and fully express Rutherford and Napa Valley in the glass. Um, and Sequoia Grove, we're known for Cabernet Sauvignons. That's what Napa Valley is known for. Um, and you can see here uh, a little bit of a picture, a window into our site. I'm going to briefly talk about um, what makes our site so special and then the choices that we make here at Sequoia Grove to best express site because that's all winemaking in, involves choices. And so um, I'm gonna touch on the couple of things that we think about um, as we're crafting wine. Okay. Um, in Rutherford, one of the really important things, especially for our site here, are the Mayakamas mountain range. You can see it on this photo there, um, the blue hills in the distance, um, and then this overview as well. Um, Napa Valley is a valley, obviously, flanked by the Mayakamas on one side that are more lush and the Vaca mountain range on the other side. And the valley acts like a straw. So pulling up the cool uh, air from the San Pablo Bay in the morning, cooling down those nighttime temperatures into the 50s, which are cru crucial to preserve color, acidity, and flavor profile. Those are ingredients in the greatest wines of the world. So that's crucial. And then when the sun heats up, um, that straw blows the cool air back out to the bay. We get up into the 90s uh, during the growing season. Again, that's crucial to ripen Cabernet Sauvignon and give us those lush, full-bodied, um, complete tannin that we look for in, in the greatest wines of the world, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and you can see here where the little sequoia tree um, on the map outlines exactly where Sequoia Grove is in Rutherford. Um, we're a small family-owned winery that was founded in 1979. I'm very excited to share that we just recently completed a nearly $15 million renovation um, with the bulk of that investment in something behind the scenes in updating our winery and our winery processing equipment. So it's something that um, if you come to Sequoia Grove, you might not see. It's a pure investment in quality. We also invested in our commitment to the environment. Very excited to share that we're a member of 1% for the planet, which is um, a hard to get into organization where you're required to prove your commitment to the environment. Um, we've done that through our Napa Green Winery Certification and our Napa Green Land Certification. These are independent third-party certifications um, that acquire, require a, an audit every three years. Um, so very excited that we're a part of that. So a virtual welcome to Sequoia Grove. If you come to visit us, which I hope you do, um, you will... Uh, come to visit us through our historic 120 year old barn. Don't laugh, Champagne, that's old for California. <laughs> um, and you might get a glimpse of our fairy ring of sequoia trees on the property. We have quite a few. A fairy, um, a fairy ring, yeah. You can come and, and look up at the canopy of the sequoia trees on the property and feel the energy you know, of the site. Again, a big uh, investment in winemaking. We do a lot of experimenting with French oak and trying to pair the exact French oak cooper to our different blocks on the property, which I'll talk about here briefly. Um, what makes the site great for growing Cabernet Sauvignon, which is that consistent temperature day in, day out during the growing season, highs in the 90s, lows in the 50s, also makes it great to enjoy a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon outdoors. So I encourage you um, to come visit one of our three patio spaces um, when it's safe to do so. Again, uh, the choices we make in the vineyard are really 
trying to make that environment the healthiest one possible. We have 65 estate acres in Rutherford. Um, we work hard in the vineyard. We have cover crop planted every row. We have bluebird boxes. We don't use Roundup. You know, all of these choices really, um, you know, go towards that end result of, of beautiful terroir expressed in the glass. We have quite a few sequoia trees, but we also have um, a handful of oak trees on the property that we work hard to uh, preserve and protect as well. This is back to the estate vineyard. Um, this is back by the river um, where there's some YOLO, um, YOLO, more rocky soil, um, but the majority of the vineyard is bale clay loam. Again, that beautiful alluvial fan that washed down over the Mayakamas and out through the river, which is located behind um, the Sequoia Grove estate property. That's really crucial for um, consistently growing Cabernet Sauvignon year in and year out, giving that, that even vine canopy to every vine in the row. Um, is really crucial. And then selecting the right clone and rootstock combinations to that site. So that's, I think, where the winemaker and the viticulturist um, choices come in because the mere nature of planting a vine in a vineyard is a choice that you have to make. And, and what, what clone, what rootstock are you going to choose to do that? Um, and so we've worked really hard, um, I think, we're part of that next phase of replanting in Napa Valley, where we're doing a deep dive into the clonal selection and the clonal diversity um, of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is, is really exciting. Um, you can see here Sequoia Grove on the forefront and then the drier Vaca mountain range um, in the background. So there's two estate properties are highlighted. Um, we are on the Rodeo Drive there of of Napa Valley um, right there on Highway 29 um, next to Cake Bread Cellars. And you can see the river line there um, back behind the winery. Our other estate property is called Tanella. This is really in the sweet spot of vine age for California, which is 10 years old. Um, we divided up these 50 acres um, into different clone and rootstock combinations. Um, the rootstock selection, I think, is really crucial for the tannin profile of, of a Cabernet Sauvignon. That affects how um, the, the palate feels, how the vine um, ripens and ripens the fruit. And then the clonal selection is really the flavor expression. So if we've done our job to select those clones, that goes a longer way to fully expressing the beautiful Rutherford site and getting all those black cherry cocoa powder flavors to come out. Um, we have some rare clones on the Tanella property, um, a suitcase clone called Weimer, um, and then a Healy clone um, as well. So uh, hopefully if you come to the winery, we could taste those on their own. Again, here's a bird's eye view of the drier Tanella Vineyard. They're only about a mile from each other, the estate Sequoia Grove property and the Tanella estate, but this is much more volcanic soil, much drier, slightly warmer. Um, and you can see by the Vaca mountain range, um, you know, much more rockier than um, the site across, across the valley. Um, and so all that, those two estate vineyards are really the bulk of our Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, which is what we're known for. It's our flagship wine. And then we select from these jewel, um, highly sought after vineyards throughout Napa Valley for the remainder of the blend areas um, in Atlas Peak, Oak Knoll and St. Helena. So although there's a Rutherford focus, um, you know, really for this wine, it's all of Napa Valley in a glass. So getting those complexities of flavor, although you still get that black cherry, that cassis um, coming out uh, from, you know, more, much more Rutherford focus. Um, it is a Bordeaux blend. If you noticed, we have all five Bordeaux varietals planted on, on the estate and some more Malbec coming, which I think that's the next stage of replanting, doing a deeper dive into non-cab varietals. Um, which are really crucial for a complete Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, 
but we can't do it, I think, on its own. And then surprise, although we're known for our Cabernet Sauvignons, um, we also make a small amount of Chardonnay, which I highly encourage you to seek out. It's mostly sourced from three vineyards, sourced from three vineyards in the southern part of Napa Valley, um, much more closer to the bay. Um, and it's a great food wine, which I'm really excited and proud about. Um, and that's because we don't go through a lot of malolactic fermentation. I think that preserves sight more as well. You get the beautiful pear, the lemon lime, the stone fruits, those primary fruit characteristics to come out. Um, and then a little bit of lee stirring brings out the brioche characteristic, um, the toasted almond. And then I do think that the right amount of oak is important for Chardonnay. So we found that to be about 30% um, new French oak in our Chardonnay. So altogether, uh, it makes uh, a more complete wine. Um, so again, I want to encourage everyone to please come visit us at Sequoia Grove. Um, love to share a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon with all of you and you, Lars, as well, and all panelists. <laughs> Fantastic. Well done. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Um, wines are delicious. They've got, you, you can definitely tell that balance between the, the potential of the soils there, rich Napa to, uh, soil, and the uh, very judicious use of, of the oak regimen. Nice balance to them, nice uh, fruit and complexity all around. So they really are beautiful wines. Thank you for sharing them and explaining the, uh, the whole background to them. And congratulations on achieving some great balance. Thank you. All right. So now we go to a man who, in certainly in sommelier circles, doesn't need much introduction uh, in the wine world, on the some, some part of the wine world, but um, new to me as a wine producer. Uh, Doug Frost, uh, one of the few individuals, one of four MS Master Sommelier and Master, uh, master of Wine uh, in the country. Uh, Doug has been a, a consultant, an author, uh, known very, very well. And um, now he's a producer as well. Uh, he is the owner and founder of uh, Echolands Winery in Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, so what was that like, Doug, after, after maybe critiquing and consulting for <laughs> Wine producers for years, now you're in the hot seat. Oh yeah, no, it's extremely humbling. I mean, there, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's like, I knew I didn't know, but I've really gotten every day to enjoy more things I didn't know. And, uh, you know, in the, in the course of learning, I continue to not know. So, you know, it's, it's uh, but it, honestly, it's why I signed up. It was this opportunity um, to, to uh, feel like um, some of the knowledge that, that I, I think I learned out of books and from talking to people and learning from people like like uh, Luca and, and you know all, all these great folks uh, online right now it, it, it was a chance to say did any of it take you know <laughs> did I actually understand anything that these people were trying to teach me let's taste so, it and find out. <laughs> yeah so well I'll, I'll do a, a quick um, a, 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 a quick download if I may of, of uh, you know my uh, my program uh, and, and so you can kind of take a look at it. Um, but I, I do want to start out by saying, you know, thank you, Lars. Thank you, Meredith, tasting panel. Um, I, I'm, I'm the baby here, definitely. And um, there, there's so much for me to learn in terms of understanding how to achieve balance. I certainly, uh, you know, that's, that is uh, uh, the goal. Um, the name, just to explain very briefly, is to say, uh, uh, and maybe to, uh, no pun intended, to echo what we're talking about a little bit here today, is the sense that um, while the, the, the vineyard that we started with, which is depicted upon the label, we just planted it, so it's not showing up in our grapes yet. This comes from a well-established, well-respected vineyard called uh, Lake Colleen. Um, the idea of Echolands was one that I live in Kansas City, even though I'm uh, helping to make wine in Walla Walla, there is a winemaker there. You know, I just show up and, and make poor decisions and my winemaker fixes them after I leave. Um, so I travel back and forth a lot. But I, I thought it was a, a, an apt metaphor for the winemaking process, frankly. Um, if you go back to Ovid's Metamorphosis, where we get a lot of our myths, the myth of Echo is this, uh, you know, spirit that wants to take corporal form so she can express her love to this youth she's fallen in love with. But the rule is she can only repeat what is said to her. And I thought that that was a, a lovely metaphor for winemaking in, in essence you know, you can only repeat what the grapes, you can only say what the grapes already are saying. 
you know, it, it, exactly as, as David has described, all you can do is screw it up. You know, it's like you, you can't add to this conversation. You can hopefully preserve it. And, and so, you know, for my part, I, I just wanted, I, I liked the idea of putting that in the name um, so, that, so that we could remember it all the time, if nothing else. Um, so one of the things that, that we um, focus on, uh, needless to say, is, is the, the you know, point of, of, of maturation that we um, select for our Syrah. And while this cluster isn't ready to pick, obviously it's not even fully colored up yet, um, it's closer than most of our neighbors uh, in terms of where we like to, to harvest. We tend to harvest a bit uh, unripe because of this notion of, of terroir, which has already been explained. I think Orsi, uh, you know, and, and hi to Orsi, who I have had the honor of working with before, you know, thank you for all that. It, it is so many different things are, are in play. Um, but the, the uh, fascinating story of, of Washington and part of Oregon is the story of the Missoula floods which if we go back to about 15,000 years ago, um, in, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll show this simpler slide. Um, you have this massive glacial lake that breaks open several times. Um, it starts about 15,000 years ago. There were people living there. So imagine now what it was like to see a 200 foot wall of water traveling 45 miles an hour at you. Um, I'm gonna say it was a short but exciting day. And um, it, it ch you know, changed the landscape of so much of Washington and so much of, of Oregon. And um, you can see, I mean, it was a controversial theory for a long time, but it's it been proven in the late 50s, early 60s, when a, 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 you know, finally, if nothing else, we could look at, at you know, sort of this picture here and imagine that it looks a bit like it does in a creek bed um, as the, the water pushes sediments back and forth. So much of, of um, uh, Washington viticulture is dependent upon um, the, the vestiges of this, where it's scraped clean and there's nothing but basalt or whether it's this stuff um, you know, that's kind of piled up. Or in the case of, of Walla Walla, which I've, I've circled here, so much of what you have is what the Austrians call Lus, which is just basically dust. So now imagine this, you know, 15,000 years ago, these walls of water plowing through here, hurl all this dust into the air and it's still settling. So much of Lake Helene, as, as I can show you here in a second, and, and, and I'll show you where Lake Helene is here, but this is uh, the Walla Walla Valley and, and the, the floods themselves sort of stopped right here. They backwashed up into the, into the foothills here. And so a part of Walla Walla is very influenced by it, part is not. And, and here now you can kind of see where Lake Helene is. It is. So it's up in a more elevated site. And that was also um, my, my belief that, the, the, that we needed a bit of an elevation if we were gonna make a, a slightly nervier, higher acid, uh, a per, uh, you know, higher acid and, and uh, slightly lower alcohol um, style of wine. Um, this is my fancy quote from Greg Harrington, who without question is one of the reasons I'm in Walla Walla, but to a great degree, one of the, the, the maybe the major reason I'm in Walla Walla, and he loves Lake Helene too, is, is frankly for the people. I, I have been going there for well over 30 years as a, as a wholesaler and a distributor and a buyer and just fell in love with a, a group of people there and really felt like I, there were people who would have my back since there's so much I don't still know. As you can see, it's right on the Oregon-Washington border. And here's kind of the, you know, the, the, the money shot now. Um, that's Dr. Kevin Pogue, who is our resident geologist. Um, the first guy I called when, when I um, started thinking about trying to buy some land here and trying to become active here. And uh, Kevin's down in a pit and you can see, I mean, if you look at the soil, it literally is just settled dust from, from uh, multiple generations. And now in this, this soil cut, you know, in this, this display here, you can imagine Lake Helene is kind of right there. So the yellow band is the, the Missoula flood sediments. Um, if you get down into the area that's quite famous known as the rocks, you add to it this riverbed stuff that can, can be quite deep and, and my, complaint, if you will, about that area. The reason we haven't focused upon it, um, as so many do, is because it tends to be really high pH. And I'm trying to make, a, a again, a nervier, I hope, balanced um, style. So Lake Clean is uh, in the Lus, and then you've got what are called the old gravels, and, and then finally the Columbia River basalt, all part of um, this chain of volcanoes, you know, California to, to Washington to Vancouver, are all part of um, uh, you know, that, that ring of fire that we talk about around the, the, uh, the Pacific. 
So in, in, in essence, um, our goal is to, to um, and that, that's the team there. Um, in essence, our goal is to try to make a wine uh, with this, as, as everybody talks about, you know, we all try to do the same thing, see if we can get the purest expression that we can. Um, we um, are doing what we would regard as, as uh, native yeast fermentations, which um, is simply to say, we just do a PD Cave, just pick some grapes, squish them by hand in a bucket, leave them outside, let nature do its thing. And um, for the for the lay clean, you know, hand harvested, foot stomped, punch it down by hand uh, twice a day in these, um, you know, macro bins and dump in the Pied de Cuvée to get fermentation going. And um, it, it was interesting to me uh, within this winery that, that we rent facility in because we're still, like I said, we're still babies. We don't even have a spot yet. Um, there have been, there, you know, like three dozen wineries there and yet, People hadn't been doing native ferments there, and and the, you know, the prevailing wisdom was sort of, hey, dude, that's a little too risky. And I'm like, you're he- you've been here for a dozen years. There's like 40 wineries here. I can scrape the walls and stick my hand in the grapes and probably start a fermentation. You know, <laughs> um, and, and ditto. Surprisingly for me, the winemakers online will laugh because I had my mind blown that we were just through primary ferm- fermentation and malolactic had already happened. I didn't add anything, it just took off, you know? And I was like calling all my winemaking friends going, what is happening? And they're like, oh yeah, it happens, don't worry about it. You know, I'm like, oh, there's so much to learn. Um, but, but again, you know, the bugs are everywhere and, and um, you know, those things can, can happen on, on their own. Now our, our uh, purpose, if you will, or, or, or methodology is only one out of five barrels is new. 100% French oak. We only use punchants, so 500 liter uh, barrels to to change, if you will, and decrease the the wine to oak uh, a- exposure. Trying to increase, if you will, the the, the wine to oxygen exposure in in, in that sense. It, to me, I've always loved punchants for certain grapes. I wouldn't necessarily use them for for you know Cabernet Sauvignon uh, ever. I mean, maybe Cabernet Franc, but but Syrah to me, it, it feels like it needs that oxygen and. And so punch, you know, 100% punchins and only 20% of them new seemed like the way to go. Um, we use 2% Vignet um, because uh, the, you know, the Syrahs that I have loved over the years are in the Northern Rhone and used barrels, large punchins, a little bit of Vignet and Coverti was, was, you know, part of the wines that I loved. And so uh, for my purposes, it, it made sense. Plus the Vignet is literally on the next block uh, uh, for our, our uh, Lake Colleen, uh, Block 49, which is where uh, the more elevated side in Lake Colleen that we, um, we, we pull from. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, Taylor Oswald is on the right. He's been making wine in Walla Walla for 10 years. I'm, I'm the newbie and we start from the back end. So as you can see, Taylor is faster at this than, than I am. I'm still, I'm still learning, but I, I have to say, um, I, I have studied this of course my whole life and have the utmost respect for um, the, the, the people on, on uh, you know, this, this call, the Zoom uh, with me, because I think the fortitude to keep at this is, is maybe the craziest part of winemaking uh, of all, because every year you're thrown something completely different, if, if not in 2020, completely out of line, uh, stuff like the fires. And, and yet you have to find some way to stay true to yourself and, but still adjust, 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 adjust. And I, I remember struggling with this question uh, with a friend of mine who said, you know, there's 10,000 decisions that go into a bottle of wine and, and I couldn't imagine it. And then one day I realized, well, you create the protocol that makes sense and you set that, but not in stone. And then you can make the adjustments as they happen. You can make the adjustments on the fly, but it is only experience that teaches you which adjustments to make when and how. Um, and that is the part very much that I'll spend the rest of my life learning, even if, you know, I, I now have oh. just three vintages under my belt. Not bad for a Kansas City boy. And uh, I love the fact that, Doug, with your uh, MSMW, but I, I think the more you learn, the more you realize you never stop learning. So thank oh, you. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Maybe you can address those there. That would be wonderful. Um, and we're going to need to move on. So I'm going to ask you to take your share screen down. And yes, I'm sir. Going Sorry to- about that. We're going to take a trip to Toscana and uh, talk with my dear friend Enrico Villerchio, who is sitting. That is not a virtual background, is it, Enrico? You are in the cellars, yeah? It's a virtual background. It's a very cold cellar. 
<laughs> you look a little chilly. <laughs> So, of course, Castello Banfi is known most for its Brunello di Montalcino, but uh, the wine you're going to talk about today is your Cum Laude, which is a uh, yeah. wonderful cuvee of different yeah. varieties grown on the estate. Uh, we have, as you know, Banfi in Montalcino. Do you share the presentation or I share? Uh, if you have it to share, please do. Otherwise, I can. Uh, let me see. I think if you can, it's better. Con piacere. No, no, no. Eh, se lo trovo. I know it's here somewhere. I just had it. Mm. Give me. We a are uh, now from. Uh, I'm here in uh, Montalcino. As you know, Banfi is uh, Castello Banfi, or better, Banfi in Italy has uh, two estate, uh, one in Piedmont, in the south part of uh, Piedmont, uh, where we produce uh, basically uh, more uh, bubbles, uh, Metodo, Cla Metodo Classico and uh, Metodo Charmat and Gavi, and uh, the, uh, let's say, the central yeah. headquarter is uh, Montalcino based in, in our Castello Banfi property. Uh, Montalcino <coughs> in Tuscany, we have also uh, most of the vineyards are located in Montalcino, that is uh, an estate uh, of uh, almost more than 7,000 acres. And uh, we have also a uh, small estate uh, in other areas in Tuscany, from the Chianti Classico, Chianti, on the coast, uh, in the, the Bulgaria area, and in the Maremma, and in the Maremma side. We arrived in uh, Montalcino in uh, 1978. So we are, uh, let's say, a very young and dynamic uh, uh, producer of Montalcino. We arrived in Montalcino in 1978. Montalcino is a small village of uh, 3,000 people, 5,000 people uh, all the territory. And uh, uh, the Mariani family, John and Larry Mariani, assembled this uh, property that, uh, let's say, compared to the average uh, property in Italy at the time, and also now, it's uh, quite uh, a very large property in a small area of Montalcino. Uh, it is uh, characterized by the territory of Montalcino. It's uh, very... Uh, let's say very challenging and very interesting because uh, we have uh, been uh, sitting and uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time in uh, zonation and the soil study because uh, due also to the uh, geological origin of uh, uh, Italy and particularly this part of Italy, we are really sitting uh, on a constellation of very, very different uh, micro uh, terroir. Um, a combination uh, uh, of, of course, different altitude, different geological origin, different soil composition. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, could be, let's say, uh, challenging or frustrating. It depends on how you, uh, what is your vision, what is the vision on uh, viticultural activity in a territory like this, where, of course, the main varieties is the Sangiovese. Sangiovese is, uh, let's say, the pillar of the Tuscan viticulture, but uh, uh, in an estate like this, uh, when we start uh, studying uh, really uh, this uh, territory, the idea was uh, uh, to, of course, uh, uh, following a zonation study, a classification of the soil and the different uh, micro terroir, also to not only select uh, the best soil for uh, uh, Sangiovese, Brunello di Montalcino, but also to uh, evaluate also the uh, introduction of uh, other varieties uh, pretty new to the territory of uh, Montalcino, both in the red varieties and in the white uh, as well. So for what concerns the red, uh, we work a lot with Syrah, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. Now we are also working with Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, that are the, the, the main variety in addition to San Giovese. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, the combination between territory and uh, winery. Uh, it's uh, true, everyone, if you look to a lot of, uh, listen to a lot of presentation, the wine is uh, done in the vineyard. And blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's particularly true because the wine is produced with grape, at least in, at least in our, uh, in certain countries. Uh, it's important, uh, of course, uh, uh, I have a, a friend of mine who, define the role of a winemaker is uh, the role of a winemaker is uh, to disassemble uh, the grape uh, and uh, to reassemble the grape uh, in a different uh, physical status uh, that is a liquid status uh, closing it into the bottle and uh, losing uh, less uh, you can of what you get from the grape so it's particularly true that uh, the Good wine can come only from uh, a good or excellent grape. Bad wine can come also from excellent grape. That is something that some Good wine can come from bad grapes. <laughs> good wine from bad grapes is a little bit more difficult. Probably is the most challenging uh, vision. But in reality, this is, is what is winemaking and the techniques, uh, the knowledge, uh, and the capability of winemaker to work with agronomists and to interpret uh, any single vintage, because another aspect that probably sometimes is not correctly evaluated is that we have to reset ourselves every, every single vintage, because every single vintage, more than ever in the last uh, years, uh, due to the climate change, uh, is very different from the previous one. The capability to interpret the same vineyard, interpret it. The vineyard are aging. The vineyard are one year more every single year. And the capability to interpret it is into a wine. So in our estates, uh, at a certain moment, uh, working with the Sangiovese from one side, and uh, let's say, I don't like the name international variety. I say varieties who are not yet present uh, into this part of the world. Uh, we created, we wanted to create a product that is uh, probably representing more than other products, uh, what is uh, the terroir of our, our estates, that is our cum laude. Here we have the 16 vintage, that is a blend of uh, four varieties. It's not easy to find out blends with Sangiovese. Sangiovese is not an easy variety to blend with others. But it is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Sangiovese, and Syrah. Uh, each single variety, of course, is verified separately and uh, age also in uh, uh, differently. For example, for Sangiovese, we use a barrel of 60 and 90 hectoliters, while for what concerns Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Syrah, we use uh, since the beginning uh, a barrel of 350 liters, uh, predominantly of uh, French oak, of different, of course, essence of French oak, but uh, of all of uh, French uh, oak. And this is a wine that is uh, basically uh, assembled uh, together in a bottle, uh, the interpretation of uh, four varieties uh, in the uh, terroir of uh, Montalcino. So Enrico, how do you think, you know, do you see cum laude as more of an expression of the varietal mix complementing each other or is it an expression of the terroir or a little bit of both? I think that it's difficult to, in any wine to find out the difference because uh, uh, we have uh, what is uh, predominantly. Uh, I remember someone talking about, uh, Luca talking about a Nebbiolo in the Virginia. Yeah. Of course, there are varieties that are, uh, find out uh, their home, their preferred home in certain uh, uh, climate. Then, of course, with the, the, the knowledge we have now, we can also cultivate variety that in the past were not uh, suitable for certain territories. But at the end, the perfect marriage between this variety in a certain climate and in a certain terroir. In my opinion, is a mix of them, and uh, the, the, uh, and this is what we really is our. Uh, goal to achieve our desire that uh, you have not to distinguish where you have not to distinguish exactly if one uh, is uh, 
predominant versus the other. It's a blend between the territory and the variety cultivated into this territory. Fantastic. Now, I notice, uh, well, I don't want to ask you any winery secrets, but I'm guessing that the order of the varieties that are listed here uh, is the order of predominance in the blend? The first variety is Cabernet Sauvignon, followed by Merlot, and then Sangiovese and Syrah. Basically, the blend uh, is uh, in terms of uh, majority Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, more or less in the same percentage are representing about uh, from 60 to 65 percent of the blend. And the remaining portion is more or less split in equal, in equal uh, weight between Sangiovese and Syrah. Okay, that's uh, poor Sangiovese is all I can say. <laughs> 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 Siraz certainly more outspoken, but that's cool. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Lars. Grazie. Okay. Uh, now I'm the one that has to stop sharing. Fantastic. And uh, now we're going to take a slight departure, not in our theme. We're going to take a departure from wine, but we're still going to talk about balance between the growing area and the production area. So August Sebastiani, uh, a famous uh, name, of course, uh, from California, who um, fourth generation of a wonderful California winemaking family, uh, student of political science like myself, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, started, uh, joined his father and brother in, in business back in 15, in 05, sorry, and then in 2015 split off this three badge, uh, which is, I, I love the, your, your definition of mix of enology and mixology. And uh, we're talking today about a single agave uh, field, uh, which is the, the, the correct termination. You, 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 you terminology you taught me yesterday, Mage, Magway? Magay. Magay, there it, we go. It's pronounced Magay, exactly right. Okay. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, thank you very much for having me. Good morning to everyone uh, west of the Rockies and afternoon to everyone east of the Rockies. Uh, but uh, honored to be a part of this conversation, considerably humbled to see, you know, some of the folks that, you thought to include me on. Um, but my, uh, as you mentioned, as fourth generation uh, winemaker, uh, we actually have focused on spirits and mixology here at Three Badge. Not so much uh, a departure from the family uh, business as we've done grappas, we've done brandies and all sorts of, you know, distilled spirits from, from the wine world, including my dad imported uh, white Armagnac uh, back in the 90s and all sorts of stuff. So we've, we've always had some level of participation in, in the, higher, uh, the higher proof uh, end of the business. But what we've done here at Three Badge is taken our negociant model that we use for wine and import it uh, into the spirit space, which gives us an opportunity to go and scour the globe for rums and gins and specifically as we're here to talk uh, today, mezcal. Now, what's cool about Mezcal as it pertains specifically to, let me share my screen here and get started with uh, our brand Bozal. So as you can see, Bozal Mezcal is, um, translates specifically to wild or untamed. Uh, and it's an opportunity to uh, really um, bring an education to the world about what Mezcal is. You know, everyone has their preconceived notions about, you know, the, the story with the worm from back in college or whatever it happens to be. And what's interesting is, is the entire category of Mezcal has, has graduated to a more premium uh, space and a more premium offering. And, and that is really, uh, if anything, the common thread throughout uh, our entire spirits portfolio. Uh, ironically, somewhat, uh, Bozal was one of our later entrants and later releases into spirits, but perhaps the most uh, uh, the most appropriate coming from wine, having cut my teeth in wine um, and, and learning about varietal Maguey and how, uh, how it is celebrated, just as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and, and Zinfandel, uh, frankly. So um, here is a list of, of our lineup. We actually uh, are working on, I believe, our 19th different uh, expression um, from, uh, from our Bozal lineup, and we tier it in four different categories, as you can see here. The yellow bottle uh, is what we call our ensemble, and it's a blend of, uh, of three different varieties. It um, is, is more of our entry level. It's uh, you know, what you might find on a back bar uh, in, a, in a cocktail program. 
the blue bottle uh, that you see here is our uh, pro probably our, our most heralded uh, tier, which is single Maguey. And that's, again, the most specific connection to wine as you talk about uh, single varieties of Maguey, just as you would talk about single varieties of wine, of, uh, of, of grapes. Our Sacrificio tier is, uh, is very different and maybe the most fun to talk about because culturally, uh, there is a part of the distillation process throughout southern Mexico and, and actually most of Mexico is, as they're producing mezcal or those states that are allowed to produce it, where they will include a protein, an animal in the, uh, in the still. And in some instances, as you'll see here, our, our Borrego, the top of that, that line, it's uh, lamb, right? And we will actually suspend a lamb leg in a basket in the still as the uh, as the uh, as the distillation takes place and as the vapors go through it imparts all sorts of flavor and again culturally uh, these small palencas that put the product together have a huge fiesta uh, in the wake of it and they they actually eat the the le the leg of lamb that happened to be, be uh, in the still right and uh, you know and they go to the obviously um, whatever produce is available nearby and and included, it's, it's a very, very beautiful process. And then our Reserva is our most premium tier. Uh, the Reserva actually is the ancestral method, which specifically is, um, is fermented in clay, uh, clay pots, which is the most uh, traditionally appropriate uh, process for, for production there. Um, here's a few photos, as you can see on the far left, uh, you'll see uh, when we, you harvest the, uh, the pina of the agave, you, um, it's just such a beautiful perspective. Um, what we're here to talk about today is our Cinezo. And what's interesting mostly about the Cinezo is that it is a massive uh, pina. It's a massive heart of the agave. Uh, in some instances, the plant can be uh, six feet or even larger. Uh, it is not harvested until uh, almost nine years, in fact. Um, and we'll obviously get into the specifics of uh, the region of Durango where uh, where we produce our Cinezo, but it's, it's, uh, it's a high altitude. So it's volcanic earth. It's, um, uh, it, it actually, what's cool about it is you add the, the uh, uh, it grows between, that's what I was going to say, it grows between uh, 6,000 and 8,500 feet of uh, elevation. Wow. So it's, it's just, it's very interesting as you kind of work your way through. Here it is on the map. Uh, as you can see, there are eight different states throughout Mexico for which you are allowed to produce mezcal. Uh, we produce mezcal in three of them. As you can see, you've got Durango, Guerrera, and Oaxaca, which is you know kind of the capital thereof. <clears throat> uh, and then again, as you drill down to to Durango, uh, it's you know heavily forested. It's high elevation. Um, the Cenizo, as I've mentioned, it's a it's a massive, massive plant uh, that takes a lot of work um, to harvest. And in, in many instances, when it is uh, cooked, right, they bury it in the earthen pit and they cook it. Um, it, it actually cooks much quicker uh, than, than many other uh, appellations. Uh, and, and if you go down to Oaxaca, for instance, um, you, you need to spend a lot more time cooking, which imparts a lot more smokiness. So as you, as you look at the higher elevation, it cooks quicker. And even though it's a large uh, pina, it doesn't really uh, impart as much of the smokiness as you might see in some other, uh, some other offerings. Is that because pictures. I'm sorry, is that, that? Because it, I mean, is that because it's larger? So it doesn't, the smoke doesn't penetrate as much? Is that uh, uh, that's a bit, no? that's a big part. Yes, that's a big part of the reason. Yes, but also because it's, it's, um, the, the earth retains heat so much better that it actually cooks, you know, physically quicker. So there's less smoke exposure okay. uh, to it. And here, here's a few photographs of, of the hillside and you can kind of, or mountainside, as you can see, um, some higher elevation uh, stuff. It's just, it's beautiful and, and very, very impressive. Uh, here are some specific photographs of, uh, of our Maestro Mezcalero here. Um, and let me, uh, you know, kind of show some, uh, here, as you can see, the second picture is that earthen pit, uh, when it, when it cooks in some instances, in some of the lower elevations, it's actually covered. It's almost like, uh, 
you know, how would you describe it? Almost like a luau, right? Where you, you actually bury it with earth and you let it cook for, you know, 72 hours, maybe over, over several days. Uh, but the way, the way it works up here in Durango, it doesn't take so long, which is very, very cool. And then you work your way to uh, the fermentation pit, as you see in that third picture. Uh, and what else is, what also is impressive is similar to wine. Uh, and we see in Durango, they actually do punch downs, uh, which is, which is very cool. Again, another parallel to uh, coming from the wine world. Absolutely. And as you can, and as you can see, uh, again, we've got our Cenizo here. Um, and uh, we actually use a clay bottle, a ceramic bottle, which celebrates the history of the product being enjoyed in, uh, in ceramic cupitas. Um, and of course, given today's audience, you're also welcome to put it into one of these and then you can really, <laughs> you know, kind of dig into it. And again, what's fun about the Cenizo and how it is expressive of that terroir and its process is that you get a lot more minerality. Uh, the way that the distillate is, uh, is captured and condensed uh, is in a, um, uh, what is the word that I'm looking for? It's a chino, thank you, um, that, that collects it. And it's, it's in many instances made from just whatever uh, wood happens to be available locally. This is oak. And it provides some, some interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, funk almost. Uh, it's cool. It, it's like a, almost like a blue cheese uh, aroma to it. And it's, you know, it's kind of hard to be able to sit here and enjoy it uh, with, with no one else to enjoy it with me. Um, but it's very expressive. And, and we actually like to pair it with grilled meats. Uh, some mezcals have bigger flavors. Some mezcals are a little bit more minerality. Again, just like, uh, just like wine. And it depends on, on where it's harvested, whether it's uh, naturally occurring um, maguey or whether it's a, you know, a farmed um, McGay in uh, whatever, um, you know, small community you happen to find it. So uh, it's a fun category. I, you know, we learn something every day as we go out and, uh, and tell the world about it and, and try to source it. And obviously it's been some time since we've been down to Mexico uh, to, to do a sourcing trip. Um, but we continue to charge ahead and we continue to manage great relationships down there and, and have a lot of fun. Fantastic. I love the idea of that, the, the complexity that goes uh, into it. I think you're really hit on something very special. Um, Thank you. The idea of terroir with, uh, with mezcal. Uh, you know, I enjoyed, I tried the experiment. I enjoyed it both out of the copita. Uh, <laughs> sure. The glass, and I guess being a wine guy, I got a lot more of the nuances out of the wine glass. I have to say, right. What's, what's right. your preferred uh, way of enjoying it? Uh, honestly, for me, it's usually a wine glass. And, and yeah. again, what's interesting too, and uh, a very, um, uh, eye-opening experience for, for us as we dig into the mezcal space is uh, how well it pairs with food. And we spend so much time in the wine world talking about uh, pairing wine with, with whatever happens to be for dinner uh, and whether it's appetizers or, you know, uh, a barbecue plate or even dessert, right? Even, you know, a chocolate or, uh, you know, a cheese plate. Um, it, it can, it can pair with it, it, the versatility of mezcal is probably the most underappreciated component, um, that we love to talk about and we love to celebrate and embrace. Absolutely. Well, thank you, August. That's fascinating and enjoyable. Lars, thank you again. I appreciate it. All right. Stay well. Um, so that was really cool. And August there, I know there's some questions that came up, um, about the mezcal. I'm going to ask you to address those in the chat. Um, I'm going to do. shortly open it up to a question to everybody. I'm going to give you a two minute warning to get yourself ready for this question. Um, but a question came in about the 2020 vintage. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start that question with August to see if there's a vintage correlation to, um, to Mezcal. But first I just want to, um, before we, we, we go any further, I just want to, before we get more tangled up, I want to thank uh, again, Psalm Journal, Meredith May, our, our, our editor in chief, the tremendous job uh, in putting together this uh, Geographical Digest educational series, our partners at National Geographic. And I got to tell you, this book, the um, New Sotheby's, where I can get it through my screen here, the New Sotheby's um, Wine Encyclopedia is a tremendous resource. A lot of you have already known that. Good news is the last couple of webinars, this had to be reordered or uh, pre ordered, rather. Uh, it is now available and you can actually order it on Amazon. So I highly recommend it. it's a tremendous resource, very well detailed, 
very actually easy to use and easy to uh, to access. Uh, and of course, thanks to our friends at uh, SOMCON. Um, so tune into this broadcast again on SOMGO at uh, SOMJournal.com and as well as our um, YouTube channel. But um, let's run back to that question about the vintage. So um, again, I'm going to start with August and say, is there a vintage correlation of vintage importance with Mezcal? I would say uh, that it is obviously less as uh, less impactful as it is in wine, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, maybe less so for vintage, but more so for seasonality. Uh, in many mezcals, many of the um, uh, small towns that we work with, uh, it's it's a cultural experience, and and it happens to you know uh, they they, <laughs> it, they were using that locavore movement before it was cool, right? And they're just harvesting whatever happens to be grown locally whenever it happens to be ready for harvesting. And so some of the, the celebrations and, um, uh, and production methods that, that go along with it come with the timing of the year. For instance, we're getting ready to do uh, a, a vegetarian offering um, with uh, calabasa for our, um, uh, our sacrificio series. And that's something that they only obviously do in, in the fall. And so, uh, not so much vintage dating, but seasonal dating, I would say. Right. So no lamb hanging in the fermenter at that uh, on that one. <laughs> not for that one, no. <laughs> not for that one, no. But it's but you know it, we can't call it vegan because they still use uh, the tahona when it mashes the cooked agave. Uh, they use a burro to help navigate uh, around. So uh, unfortunately, we can't call it explicitly vegan, uh, but we are celebrating it as it's as a vegetarian offering. Which is no burro was harmed in the production of this mezcal. Correct. <laughs> Very correct. well said. <laughs> Thank you, August. So let's okay. work our way backwards. Again, just a real, um, what we call in New York, an elevator pitch, a very short synopsis uh, in everybody's terms, and we'll work our way backwards. So Enrico, tell us how was in general, in, in short terms, how was the 2020 vintage in your estimation in Tuscany? And Piedmont, as a matter of fact, you can go into that. Oh, 2020 was uh, a vintage with a little bit less uh, production than uh, uh, 2019, that was a very, very productive vintage in Italy, but uh, for what concern uh, the results we're seeing now, it's uh, an excellent vintage, both in Piedmont and in Tuscany, and predominantly in Tuscany is uh, a very superb vintage for San Giovese. Fantastic. Good. That's good news. Again, at least something comes good out of 2020. And, uh, and Doug, what was your experience in, in Walla Walla? We, um, we certainly had some smoke. We had about a week of smoke that just settled on the valley. It all came from the Willamette. Actually, the, the fire, uh, closest fire is about 150 miles north, but that wasn't the factor. Um, how much damage has been done to, to the, the grapes? Obviously, the grapevines are, are fine, but um, the, we, we have already determined that we had to get rid of our Petit Verdot, so we didn't bother to pick it. Sure. Um, we have five different Cabernet Franc lots, and one of them... Um, I've got my eye on, on and have already sort of surmised that I'll probably have to pitch it. Uh, and then one other I've got my eye on, but I think it'll, I think it'll sneak through. Um, this is all new stuff, uh, I, I think, for, for the whole industry. Yeah. So um, we're all having to, to learn on the fly. Yep. Otherwise, was... everything looked great. Of course, up and down the coast, <laughs> things were rocking until this happened. Yeah, yeah, just like everything looked good in February for 2020. <laughs> so Molly, talk, talk to us, you're in the in the hot seat there. Talk to us about what's going on in Napa. And yeah, well, let me talk about the beginning of the season. Like you mentioned, February, March. I remember when our world kind of stopped in March and uh, every evening, my husband and the kids and I would go and do a lap around our neighborhood and the weather was incredible. White, fluffy clouds, 75 degree temperatures and then that rolled into very consistent summer so more mild and cool temperatures which i talked about in my presentation those cooler summers are really cru crucial in napa for um color preservation um but then fall hit um and we uh we did deal with quite a few fire instances and ash fall. Um, so our harvest is um, severely impacted, I think. We're still evaluating the fruit that we did bring in. Um, 
but uh, I think all told we brought in 30% of our production and the majority of that is uh, the white wines, the Chardonnay and the white wines. So of the reds that we brought in, we're still evaluating. Um, but I, as a winemaker, I think fire is kind of a signature of the vintage. It's no different than heat or a cool spring or any other of the many challenges that you know Doug talked about that we have to we have to navigate and we have to figure out how to best express in the glass, uh, preferably an enjoyable way. Um, so I, I'm hopeful on uh, our ability to navigate those challenges and, um, and figure it out like we all have to. <laughs> yeah, we are certainly all subject to the four earth signs, aren't we? Thank you, Molly. So uh, David, uh, how did things go down in Santa Lucia? Did you... Uh escape any smoke or? Uh, we actually got fairly lucky. As Molly said, um, this is a really good point. Every vintage has its characteristics and um, 2020 was setting up to be just phenomenal in every single way. And yeah. certainly uh, the, the, the white wines uh, were a Chardonnay and Pinot House were a Burgundian house, about 65% Chardonnay were just phenomenal. Came in beautiful, had beautiful ripeness. Uh, beautiful flavors at slightly lower bricks. So just a very good tale of, of the vintage and how that speaks to the terroir. Um, we did see some, some smoke, but happily uh, we're close enough to the Pacific Ocean that it's so windy here every day. That's one of the dominant viticultural features that um, any smoke that, that, that does kind of drift, drift towards us drifts away at about one o'clock in the afternoon as the winds start howling down the Salinas Valley. So we're in that evaluation stage also. Things need to finish up malolactic fermentation. But I've tasted some absolutely stunning Pinots from this, from this vintage. It's good. It's good I have hear. great hope. Yeah, amen. Don't we all? <laughs> uh, and Luca, how were things in Virginia? Uh, I know you had some concerns. Yeah, well, it was a roller coaster vintage. <laughs> Uh, and uh, started uh, with uh, some uh, late spring frost. Uh, the last one was May 8th, not unusual uh, in Virginia, but let me say, to, so people can have an appreciation, in 32 vintages I've been here, if I aggregate the losses, it's under, it's in the single digits. So this year just happened to be uh, a bit more severe, uh, very much depending on location. So we end up the end of harvest this year with a minus 20% of crop, and which is heavy, although that was segregated in some areas that also are the part that have a bit less water retention. Mm -hmm. And and then through after that, it, we had some uh, cooler than the usual June. Then we, had, we went to a, a, a bit hotter uh, July. Then the condition started uh, going into a, a more normal season in August and September, which is really when the grapes makes a difference and you have the, the transformation from green to, to and hard fruit to then aromas and, and sugars. Some rain hit toward uh, the end of harvest, penalizing some late ripening varieties, especially for us with Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it, all in all, I would call it a, a, a good vintage with some peaks of excellence, very much depending on the varietals and the site within our 900 acres. So yeah. all in all, actually, I'm quite satisfied. Uh, and uh, not the perfect vintage, not the easiest one. But uh, as I said earlier with you, we are at the mercy of the jet stream here. It depends how it's pushing yeah. and things can change very rapidly. And so if you talk about climate change, Virginia has been there all the time. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, uh, on that note, I like to say one thing I notice here is the springs are getting uh, earlier, and we're going from a cool from a cool spring to heat a little bit faster than we used to. Okay, fascinating, interesting to see how everybody manages that as um, in the vineyards. So Xavier, uh, you you started it all off by kind of reminding us of the the perhaps um, under uh, considered importance of terroir. Tell us about the under-considered importance of vintage uh, in Champagne. Well, interestingly enough, uh, 2020 was the 245th harvest at Puy Wow. And, and the house has never been sold. So we have records back to the earlier uh, 
19th century, and it's a tre treasure of, of information and data for Jean-Baptiste Caillon, who is a scientist and a researcher. So um, uh, it really participates in the understanding of the terroir. And uh, we have the deeds of all the parcels that we started to acquire in 1841. So uh, it is very important the know-how, and I think someone was uh, um, mentioning that in the conversation, uh, it's really, I think it was David, uh, you know, to learn um, your land, good, being good steward of the land and to know how it works. And of course, uh, over a period of 245 years, uh, this, this, this is really a tremendous experience. Uh, 2020 uh, was a supernatural harvest uh, in Champagne, not just for Louis Roderer. And um, Champagne, like um, Barolo, for instance, is one of the beneficiaries of climate change and higher temperature. Yeah. So 2020 is the last of what we believe is another great uh, trilogy of harvest 2018. Uh, 2019 and, and 2020. And um, we harvest earlier because of, of the higher temperature, the change in the climate. So we started at, at the end of August, August 22nd. And uh, we started with the Pinot. Uh, we had to wait a little bit to uh, harvest the, the, the Chardonnay. We harvested Chardonnay, I think, uh, starting August the 27th. And uh, we ended up the harvest uh, September 11th. Uh, the, the natural uh, um, alcohol level was 10.5% in Champagne and 10.7% uh, in, in Louis Roder, which is which is quite high for, for Champagne, and that bids very well for the for the quality of the wine. Um, without going into the too much details, we had the fairly mild uh, uh, winter with a lot of water, which was um, uh, really needed. Uh, an early birding uh, in April, you know, a few days earlier. And of course, um, as you know, it's usually about 100 days after the budding that you start the, the harvest. Um, I started my career a long time ago in the previous century, and I was living in, in Champagne. And um, today, the harvest is at least two weeks earlier, even three weeks earlier than it used to be 30 plus years ago as the same in, ba in, in Barolo, I understand. And August is very important in Champagne. We say, c'est août qui fait le mou. The mou is the juice and août is the month of August. And what a wonderful month of August. Uh, very, very warm. Um, sometime uh, heat and uh, that uh, really sped up the, uh, the maturity of the grape. But overall, 2020 will remain, uh, not, not just for Louis Rodra, but in Champagne as, as a great vintage. All right. Fantastic. I can't wait to enjoy 2020 in the future <laughs> in so many ways. So um, get, we have it in the rearview mirror. I want to thank everybody. Orsi, thank you. Um, on behalf of National Geographic and the Sotheby's new um, wine encyclopedia, um, Psalm Journal, Psalm Con. Remember that uh, the recap will be in the January, February issue of Psalm Journal. And uh, thank you to all of those who stayed in. We went a little bit over time again, uh, but I think we had some fascinating information from all over the world. I want to thank all the panelists for their tremendous insight and uh, congratulate them on achieving wonderful balance. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye, everyone. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. All Take right. care. Happy Stay Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank it was you. a pleasure. It was a great pleasure. Grazie. Prego. Merci.